All right, well, it's nice to be with you. Uh, I'm here in uh, Leesburg today where I just had an opportunity to have a lunch session with Mr. LaRouche. And I want to communicate a couple of the ideas that were central in his thinking today and then just take up the kind of quality and thinking that we're going to have to generate in the population if we're going to achieve the progress that's implicit in the land bridge proposal. Now, Helga Zeppler-Rusch, a couple weeks ago, had a very interesting way of putting the strategic situation. She said, it's as though we're hanging on a thread between heaven and hell. And the hell is a danger of thermonuclear war. And as Lynn has been stressing, there's no guarantee we're going to have a nuclear war, but there's no guarantee that we're not. And as long as the gang that's in power in the United States right now, through Obama, and with an alliance with the neocons such as Victoria Newland and the State Department, John McCain and his crowd in the U.S. Senate, the, the crazy warmongering Republicans, and cowardly Democrats who are afraid to challenge Obama, then the impetus is moving us towards war. And it's not inevitable, but we've got to do some things to, to change that. And first and foremost, is to communicate, number one, that the reality is that war is on the agenda of the British Empire. And the second point, though, is to show that we actually are on the verge of moving into a post-Obama era. Now, this was clear from what happened on November 4th. The American people repudiated Obama and everything that he's done as president. This was not a pro-Republican vote. and In fact, it was one of the lowest numbers of uh, total voters in any recent midterm election. Uh, it was, in some states it was 33 to 36 percent. And what does that tell you? Well, we're in the midst of an incredible crisis, a war danger, but also an ongoing unfolding financial crisis. And yet people are so demoralized and have such a small level of thinking about themselves and their responsibility they didn't even vote, much less become active and involved in the campaign. Now, we did something important with our campaign in Texas, and that was that with Keisha Rogers, we made a decision. It was Lyndon LaRouche, Keisha, myself, and a couple of others, that we would use her campaign for U.S. Senate to change the agenda of the elections, to change the agenda from the social issues uh, the big government, little government, tax, no tax, to actually take up the fundamental question of the impeachment of Obama and the move toward the Eurasian land bridge perspective, which we're now saying is the U.S. must join the BRICS. We didn't quite have that formulation then, but we said we would change the discussion. And I think you can see that we were successful in doing that in the election. The issue of the 2014 midterm elections was Obama. And those who voted repudiated him. Those who didn't vote were repudiating him as well. And a small group of people voted for the Democrats just because they were so scared of what the Republicans would do. Now, this gets to the bigger issue that I want to raise in, in the minutes ahead for, for me. And that is something that's a section in the Landbridge Report called the Metrics of Progress. How do we think about what we do in our life, in our lifetime? What is it that would cause us to act to affect a political, social, economic revolution in the Western Hemisphere, in the transatlantic region? What kind of quality of self-conception is required to do that? And this gets to the heart of what Lyndon LaRouche's lifelong mission is. And he was reiterating that in the discussions we had today. Look, our, our short-term mission is in the United States, we have to get rid of Obama. Uh, in Canada, you've got to get rid of the Queen, but that's, I'm not going to discuss that. That's your business. You have to take care of that. But what we have to do together is inaugurate an era of progress based on technologies that are either available to us or that are within sight of our imagination, provided we have the determination to do it. 
And Lynn said the first thing we have to address is getting people determined to do it, making that the desire of people to clean up the mess we have in politics, which is at heart a mess in the self-conception of a citizen. And this comes back to the, the founding of our republic. And if you want to start with this idea of the metrics of progress, what is it? It's the idea of where does wealth come from? What is, what is a value? And, you know, I do a lot of different work uh, in my role as a Western state spokesman, and some of it is radio shows. And there, I do radio shows with so-called progressives. They're all anti-Wall Street, but they're impotent. I do radio shows with libertarians and Ron Paul people, and they want to get rid of the Federal Reserve as long as they don't have to do anything to do it. And you have all these people who have these ideas that are against the direction of the country. But what do they do? What are they doing with it? And I would argue that the biggest problem we have is that most of the people we talk to every day place little value on their own minds and the development of their minds. And that's why they fall prey to this idea in the case of the liberal Keynesians that all you have to do is print money, that that's how you get out of a depression. And if that were the case, then quantitative easing would have worked. They created a lot of money or notations in computers, but it's done nothing to improve the physical condition of our planet. On the conservative libertarian side, they say, just get gold, go back to gold, buy gold, buy silver. And, you know, you have to ask yourself at a certain point, have these people been blind and deaf to what's happened the last five years, where gold prices and silver prices have gone up and down with no relation to demand, no relation to a free market? It's a totally controlled operation. So what is the value, the inherent value of a Krugerrand? or an ounce of silver? What's the inherent value of a dollar bill or a euro? Now this is what we get at in the chapter in the Landbridge Report on the Metrics of Progress. Because the, the only way you can judge progress is through the means by which the human mind and the imagination of creative thinkers transform the means by which we reproduce our population. And by that I mean produce the food, the energy, the clean water, the sanitation, the transportation capability, what is generally called infrastructure. Because the development of infrastructure is the key component to cheapening the overall cost of an economy so that whatever credit you generate, you will produce more than you consume which means you have the capability to pay off the credit. So you're not creating debt. The difference between credit and debt was something that was addressed by Alexander Hamilton at the beginning of our nation. And this is where you un begin to understand this question of the relationship between real productivity and production and credit on the one side and a debt economy that's spiraling out of control either into deflation or hyperinflation on the other. So our job is to get people to understand what Hamilton understood. And this is partly what Lyndon LaRouche is calling the Manhattan Project. Hamilton, as you know, was a, an emigrant of this country. He came from the West Indies. Uh, he was picked up by a network which eventually brought him into contact with people like Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. As a very young man, he was an aide to camp to General Washington. And he, at a very young age, 18, 19, had to deal with the problem of how, of how do you finance a revolution. How do it, and by the way, this is a question we have to take up as well, isn't it? How do you convince people that a bunch of ragtag individuals with what seemed to be a utopian ideal can actually put together the political might to accomplish that objective? How do you convince people to invest in that, to buy war bonds? to buy, invest in the credit of the United States of America, which at the time had no credit and didn't exist. That was the challenge that Hamilton had. And when he became the Treasury Secretary, he applied what he had done 
with people like Robert Morris and Chaim Solomon to build up a treasury to fight the Revolutionary War. And then that was done largely through sale of bonds. Uh, and when the, the debt became a problem for the country, how do you retire a debt? And Hamilton started with a simple principle which is that you never take on a debt without a means to extinguish it. Now, this is something that the neocons and the, the right-wing conservatives in the United States don't understand, because to them, money is a self-evident quality. It's something you get from stealing from the government and stealing from the poor and stealing from other countries. It's a swindle. It has nothing to do with that which is needed to produce for a population to survive and grow. And Hamilton started with a different idea, and you see it in uh, the, the quality of thinking in his report on debt, where he said, we're going to use the debt of the United States to create a powerful nation. We're going to transform debt into a resource. By issuing new credit against it, credit for targeted investment in ports, roads, and canals, he understood infrastructure, but then also he set up in his third report on manufacturing this idea of a society for useful manufacturers, which would be funded by the product of his second report on the National Bank. Now, Hamilton says explicitly that wealth comes from increasing the productive powers of labor. He was a Leibnizian. He understood that the dynamic of an economy is ideas transforming nature. And this conception from Kepler through Leibniz through the founding fathers of America up through Vladimir Vernadsky that it's the noosphere, the realm of creative ideas that's the source of wealth. And this is what is being taken up now as the basis of economics and study in China, in Russia, in India, South Africa, and Brazil, many, many other countries where Lyndon LaRouche's ideas on economics are at the forefront of the changes that are taking place. But what Lynn was emphasizing in the last 24 to 48 hours was his relationship in particular with Russian economists, uh, one of whom just passed away in the last couple of weeks, uh, Stanislav Menshikov who was a very important figure in Soviet and then post-Soviet Russia. And many of the people around Putin today who are committed to the BRICS policy came out of the networks of, of the Academy of Sciences of which Menshikov was a leading member. This includes people like Rogozin, who's the Deputy Prime Minister for Defense Procurement in Russia. It includes Sergei Glaziev, who's one of the top economists and advisors to Putin. And they understand what LaRouche talks about when he talks about productivity and the, the power of labor, the, the wealth comes from physical production. And so what we're seeing with the BRICS is the revival of an idea that was uh, presented by Lin to the Russian Academy of Sciences on this idea of potential relative population density and energy flux density. The idea that by increasing the quality of your power supply, the, uh, by an order of magnitude as you move from coal to oil and gas, oil and gas to nuclear fission, fission to fusion, and beyond fusion to matter, antimatter, and plasmas, at each case you're increasing the reducing power of your energy source. That is, the cost and its ability to transform in increasingly impure raw materials into a quality of raw material that you can use. So that you expand the realm of physical chemistry for the sake of, of human production. Now this comes from the mind. It doesn't come from stumbling across a new mineral or a new raw material or you just get an idea, a flash of insight that you can create a plasma torch. It comes from an imagination looking at the previous discoveries from the standpoint of what is necessary for humanity. And this is how Hamilton approached the question 
of getting the United States out of debt. And he put it very simply in, in his report, his three major reports, report on public credit, report on the national bank, and report on manufacturers, that we have to create the capability where each citizen can use their mental creative powers to increase the wealth production of the society. And this does imply a division of labor. Not everyone's going to be a scientist. You still need people who can build roads and dig canals, who can develop the equipment, increasingly better equipment to do that. The power sources to take advantage of the canals and, and the dams to produce the power. So all of this comes from a conception of energy flux density creating the capability for man to increase the numbers of people who can be sustained on a given uh, uh, amount of land. And there was a Russian scientist named Pobis Kuznetsov who said we should develop a metric for this, a measure for this, and we should call it the law as short for LaRouche. Now the people in Russia who are working on the infrastructure plans for space, for the development of the strategic metals in Siberia, the infrastructure such as the Trans-Siberian Tunnel, or the Tra Bering Strait Tunnel, the high-speed rail systems, they're working from that conception. Some of them very consciously, others just as part of a general education process which has been initiated in Russia. And you can see from recent statements by Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, that he and other economists are verging on that same conception. The problem is Americans don't get it. And now I'm talking to you about Americans. Rather than insulting Canadians, I'm saying you can discuss whether Canadians get it or not up there. But until people understand where wealth comes from and understand the role of a government that's a representative of the interests of the people, that's directed by, of, and for the people. Until you have a government that has that enlightened conception of, of physical economy, we're going to continue to have swindles and scams, such as the derivatives, such as the, the, the new thing they now have now called rental-backed securities in the United States. Typical swindle. I don't know if you know about this. I mean, you had hedge funds buying up foreclosed properties. Now, the people who lost their homes, as well as the people who lost their jobs so they couldn't afford homes and just moved out, they can't get a new mortgage. So if they want to live somewhere, they've got to rent. And rental properties can be two to five times as expensive per month as a mortgage. So the hedge funds moved in started buying and selling these things, backed again by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, purchased by clients of Citibank, Morgan Stanley, and so on. And meanwhile, the, the people who lost their jobs and lost their homes are now paying through the nose for rental properties. And those rental properties are being sliced and diced and marketed as rental-backed security bonds. Now, this is where we get to this question of having to educate people. How many people are stuck in these kinds of situations where they can't buy a home? They don't have a decent job. Why is it the case? It's because they don't understand the simple principle of economics, which is that wealth comes from the development of the human mind. Not from scams. Not from buying something cheap and selling it expensive, as Adam Smith says. Not from a free market, which never existed. There has never been a free market in anything. And even some of the Ron Paul supporters are figuring that out because the gold and silver markets and commodities markets are moving up and down right now based on the financialization of futures markets of paper gold and paper oil and paper copper. So we've got to fight for a, a dual conception here. One, to get people out from accepting the idea that people with money are smart and that the goal of an economy is to make money or that wealth is an accumulation of money or assets owed to you and instead that wealth comes from the 
expansion of the number of young people who master ideas of science and technology so that we can increase the numbers of people who can be employed productively in the workforce at the frontiers of science and technology. That's what the land bridge proposal is uh, in a nutshell. That idea that the future is going to belong to those countries that recognize where wealth comes from and measure wealth from that standpoint. And so in our report, we have a whole section on this Hamiltonian question up through the years, the Lincoln policy. Actually, we start with the, the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony, then Hamilton, then the Lincoln policy. To some extent, this is what FDR did, and after the war, what the Marshall Plan represented. The Marshall Plan was highly successful without providing a whole lot of money. Money was given to a bank in Germany called the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, the Development Credit Bank. And it was through that that the German economic miracle took place. So we have ample precedents. The Russians have studied them, the Chinese have studied them, the Indians, the Brazilians, the South Africans are studying them. When will we get the Americans and the people in the northern hemisphere of the Americas to take up these questions, these issues of what is wealth? Now, that, I think, is what we have to come out of this series of meetings that we're having. Because as the intention, our intention, in order to create this economic revolution. You know, the land bridge is not a series of projects. It's an intention to transform the mission of mankind. And that's why Lynn often comes back to this question of space. It's usually those things that are outside of your existing knowledge, beyond your ken, so to speak, that define where the world is going to go. Now, at this point, I'll, I'll just finish by, by stating uh, what I think is a very important concept, which is that you have the question that keeps coming up in the United States is, can we trust the Russians? Can we trust the Chinese? Yes, Xi Jinping gave a nice speech about the peace of Westphalia and the common good, the interests of all, but can we trust them? And I find it ir ironic, I know you were talking about irony before, that it's Americans asking this question. And what I say to them is, which country on the, in the world is using drones against civilians? Which country is destroying nations? wrecking national sovereignty, destroying the infrastructure of countries in the name of regime change. And we're asking, can you trust Russia and China? Put yourself in the position of Xi Jinping when he makes an offer to the United States. He's making an offer to a country which destroyed Iraq, has done a lot of damage to Afghanistan, is allowing Syria to be destroyed, directly was involved in the destruction of Libya, and now is being involved in not just the destruction of Ukraine, but all of Europe through the EU, especially Southern Europe. And Americans ask, can we trust the Chinese? Can we trust the Russians? So we have to use these kinds of ironies to get people to recognize that what they think about the world is shaped by geopolitics, the idea of competition, of struggle, a Darwinian struggle for the survival of the fittest. And that in fact, if human beings allow themselves to be reduced to that, we're not going to have a human race beyond the next couple of years. And on the other hand, the beautiful potential within every human being for an ennobled soul, as Friedrich Schiller discusses, how is that realized? You don't just walk around and, and talk to people about how much you love them and pat them on the back and feel all warm and fuzzy. The ennoblement of the soul is a fight for your creative self. And the way you fight for your creative self is through fighting to change others. And so with this report that we have, we now have a blueprint for developing a new era of mankind, what Helga has been calling a new paradigm. And it all depends on handfuls of people giving up all their notions that come from geopolitics, from the animal kingdom, from the idea that money is wealth, 
and shifting that into recognizing that wealth is the, the potential production in the future when we carry out and implement new ideas coming from the imagination. That's the legacy of Hamilton. And it's that Hamiltonian legacy that will transform the world. And that's the principle that underlies the land bridge concept and our report of that. So that's my report to you for this afternoon. And I, I guess, I, I don't know whether we're set up to take questions or not, but you know, I'm certainly willing. To. I'm going to ask now, uh, Harley, if anybody does have any questions. And then I will repeat them. I just want to give Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Harley, from all of us. Does anyone have any questions? Either for Paul or for Harley? Yeah. There's a short comment. It's very true. There's an educational gap that has been for some time uh, with the general public in every sector of society, probably in every uh, yeah, you know, the cultures are so as to who, what and who is controlling and running society and how to uh, make a more balanced approach to that. Who's going to take responsibility? Who can you trust and who can you rely on? And until today, or the last few days, uh, haven't really heard from individuals that are willing to step up and, and come forward. It seems like we're all under a threat, even the period of the threat of the atom bomb, because if you crush man's mind, his thought processes, his scientific ability to rationalize his way out of any particular circumstance, you crush him. And I think that was the mission of psychiatry and psychology and so on. So the question is, how, how do we get to the general pop population who are being suppressed and subdued into belief in this wealth of materialism as the only consciousness of the day? Harley, did you hear that question? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, look, I think you have to start with a, an understanding of the dynamics of history. History is never made by mass movements. Mass movements are the result of a small number of dedicated activists and thinkers. Uh, this was the case most recently, if you look at the civil rights movement, uh, before you had the March on Washington, you had 10 years, 15 years, 20 years of voting rights struggles in small towns in Mississippi. You had young people around Martin Luther King studying what Gandhi had done in India. And they went out and took these ideas out to people who were terrified, who were downtrodden, who had been beaten. Um, and, gave, and inspired in them a sense that this is, this is not the nature of man. Now, we have an advantage right now. I, I can just tell you in terms of the organizing in the United States, there are more people today who are aware of the crisis than at any time in the 40 years I've been organizing. They see the danger of a U.S.-Russia confrontation. They see the collapse of the United States. They despise Obama. They see in him a complete fraud. What they don't see are solutions. Now, we're circulating a resolution in the United States, actually internationally, to get examples of people who will show the courage to stand up and say, dump this policy and go with the BRICS. We don't need a million signatures. If we could get 200 signatures of, of legislators, of um, artists, of uh, uh, people involved in, in uh, the business community, you create a groundswell. The, the problem up to this point is that there's no institutional movement to do this. The Democratic Party collapsed back in the 80s, uh, probably collapsed before that with uh, Jimmy Carter or you could say with the assassination of the last courageous Democrat, John Kennedy. So there aren't very many examples out there. Lyndon LaRouche is an example. Everything I said about what's happening in Russia and China is inspired by their long history 
but has been brought back to life by Lyndon and Helga Zepp-LaRouche. And this is acknowledged by some of the key people who are involved in this process. They run governments. So we now have governments around the world that are acting on this principle, just not Western governments. But every single Western government is facing an existential crisis in terms of uh, government debt, private sector debt, corporate debt, collapse of infrastructure, and so on. We've just got to find people, and we've got to be more aggressive, not just the average person on a street corner, but we've got to call parliamentarians. We've got to call congressmen. What we mapped out today, for example, was we've got to get to every diplomat who knows that Victoria Newland is a neocon bitch, is the way Lynn put it. And that's insulting female dogs to say that. We've got to get to the people in the State Department who hate her. They know that she's putting us on the verge of war, but they won't speak out against her. We're getting some who are privately speaking out against her. We've got to get them to organize all the others to come out and say, let's get rid of this woman. Let's change the direction of policy. So the answer to your question is you educate everyone. But those who know something about this, if you studied the report, if you understand what we're talking about in terms of the potential of the land bridge, go talk to officials, whether it's labor officials, elected officials, uh, chambers of commerce people. We've got to get people on board now. And it has the ripple effect so that, as the, the Indian Prime Minister Modi said, we can get a mass movement for development, but it's got to start with initiators. We have the initiators. We have countries initiating it. We've got to bring key networks and institutions and individuals into support of these policies in the U.S. and Canada and Mexico. We might as well add them. Harley, I'm sorry. Um, I think I, I was muted there. Um, Adam is asking a question about the. Um, I'm not sure what's happening there. I can hear you. Okay. Um, he's asking about uh, what's what's the guarantee that if Obama gets out that. Um, the next administration won't be the you know uh, striving for war and causing all these uh, disruptions all over the world. Well, I'm I'm glad to answer that question because that's the question I get all the time, and what it reflects is two things. One is an underlying cynicism that you're really not going to get out Obama, but it also underestimates the social dynamics of an upheaval of a revolutionary transformation. Right now, let me just tell you, if, if we had to impeach Obama today, which we do, the Republicans in the Senate and the House are not going to do it. They've taken impeachment off the table. Many Democrats who are now starting to speak out against Obama after the debacle of November 4th, nevertheless are saying we can't give in to the Republicans. So on the surface, you'd have to say, no way, Jose, you cannot do this. Now, on the other hand, when you talk to these people, they acknowledge Obama, you know, Schumer and, uh, uh, who is the other one, uh, Schumer and Tom Harkin from Iowa, two leading U.S. Democratic senators, said Obamacare is a big mistake. You have Feinstein attacking the president for censoring a report on torture. You have Sherrod Brown and, and others, Elizabeth Warren, attacking the New York Federal Reserve and, and the Congress for not for, for allowing too big to fail banks to exist. You have all these, then you have Senator Kane and Senator Murphy, Democrats from Virginia and Connecticut, insisting that Obama has to go to the Congress to uh, get a war agreement from Congress before he can do any more in Iraq and Syria. 
Then you have Walter Jones, a Republican. You have five or six Republicans now coalescing around Jones. What I say to the Republicans and, and Democrats is make the case. Don't worry about the number of votes you have right now. Go tell the truth about Obama in, on the floor of the House of Representatives. Build the case so the American people can see what he's really doing. If that were done, and look, we have, as you know, on LaRouchePack.com, we have more than enough information on the crimes of Obama, whether it's Benghazi, working with terrorists in, in Syria to destabilize Assad, the Chechen connection, the, the British role in, in Chechnya, and so on. We have more than enough to not just impeach the guy, but have him spend the rest of his life as a war criminal in a maximum security prison. So someone has to make the case. If that case were made, do you think Joe Biden is so stupid that he would continue the same policies? We would have a total change in the United States. And when people often say to me, well, what makes you think it would be different? If I give them a certain amount of credit, I just say the latter thing that I just said, which is that if we do this, you're going to have a fundamental change so no one would continue the policies. But the other point I would make is just check your own thinking behind the question. It really is a cynicism about the ability to succeed. And it's that cynicism. And look, it exists in all of us. We've all been disappointed. Look, we saw eight years of Bush. And then Obama got elected, and he, he went beyond what Bush did, and then he got reelected. Why do you think the African-American community in the United States is exploding over the so-called issue of white policemen shooting black youth? That's gone on for years in the United States. That's not the trigger. It's the poverty of the, that's afflicting the majority of the African-American population, which had its hope raised by the Obama presidency, which has now been dashed. So cynicism abounds. Pessimism, a, a profound conception that nothing will ever change for the good. And if that prevails, we're all finished. If, if we're not finished by nuclear war, we're finished by the degeneration of culture, which, in which human life means nothing. For those of us who really treasure and love that human potential in everyone else on the planet and wish to see it come out, we cannot succumb to that kind of cynicism and pessimism. Let's impeach the bastard and then see what happens. And I can tell you, we'll have a change in this country that you won't recognize. It, it will be as though moving into light after a year, years of darkness. Wonderful. Thank you, Harley. <laughs> Thanks again. And uh, I'm going to, I'm sorry, was there another question? Can you? Yes. Of the U.S. participation in this endeavor. So, Carly, Carl was going to answer that one if that's okay. Oh, Carly can answer. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'll just say that uh, to my knowledge, uh, the So you want me to answer that? Yeah, yeah. Please. There's no limit to the what we could do with cooperation. The first thing, just a simple thing, space. You know, the Chinese have a very advanced space program now. India is circling Mars. 
Even Vietnam has a more advanced space program than we do right now. But we have a history. We have lots of older engineers and scientists who have developed this, the craft that got to the moon, the Mars rover and things of that sort. Imagine if we pooled resources and the intention was not just to go someplace, but to change where we're going and to use where we're going, for example, with helium-3 to develop nuclear fusion. Every country has a fusion program. In most cases, they're not that advanced. In, in the case of the United States, it's being shut down. So cooperation at the frontiers of science, something that the five BRICS countries just did the last 24 hours, is they came up with a plan to inoculate everyone in the world from tuberculosis, to take responsibility to produce the vaccines and to deliver them. So everyone in the world can get a, a uh, immunized against tuberculosis and, and along with that to join efforts for Ebola. So these are some of the kinds of things. Now in terms of China, look, China has to deal with one and a quarter billion people. They're doing a pretty good job of developing new technologies. They're no longer just copying or stealing patents, they're developing new technologies. Again, imagine what could be done in areas such as energy production, uh, transportation, you know, you still need to build the high-speed rail systems. You need the resources to do it uh, in terms of developing steel, specialty steel, uh, the machine tools to build the quality of instruments that are needed to run these things. The, the basic point is there's a very large potential division of labor that could incorporate millions of people in the United States who are underemployed right now, people who are skilled workers, skilled machinists who are working at 7-Elevens and selling insurance on the side. But then think about the future. Think about what young people, what's going on with young people in the United States. They're getting bad education for very expensive prices for no jobs. The ones who are the higher uh, from the, the better families with money to put them in the better schools, they're going into finances. They're not going into industry, industrial, engineering, uh, metals research and things of that sort. If we had a commitment to the land bridge, and there were apparently in Washington DC at the event, there was someone who raised the question, he said, my God, <clears throat> if we do all these things, where do we get the manpower? The first thing to look at is the transformation of human beings by making a commitment to do this. And then we'd have to map out, as if, if you look at the report, you'll see all the projects that are already there that would require a full bill of materials. Uh, that would mean we'd need new steel plants, we'd need, need new heavy equipment development, machine tool production. And the only way to do that is a crash program from the top as collaboration. Now, if we took up the offer from Xi Jinping, that's what we would do. And what we would find in the United States is we need a crash program for all the people under 30 years old who at this point have no really uh, productive skills. Not through their own fault, although many of them have gravitated into a drug culture and a dead-end culture. But if you create a culture that inspires people, and I'll just finish with this point because I think this is always important to emphasize. My generation, when I was a child, John Kennedy told us we were going to go to send a man to the moon and return him safely. And we're going to do it not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And this inspired people. That inspiration never left me. The idea that we could do things like that. If you had a competent president, who could inspire people not just with words the way Obama does, but with real conceptions and actions. So that young people got the idea that what they did for the next 60 years would have meaning for the next 600 years. Then you would see an unbelievable change on the planet. This is what Modi's trying to do to inspire the people of India. Starting with something simple like cleanliness, cleaning the streets, cleaning the water. He's talking about millions of jobs doing that and, and moving beyond just brooms, starting with brooms, but moving beyond that. So 
there's more than enough to do. The question is having the quality of inspiration that will move people to take that up. Once we get this adopted, you, you look at that report, you'll see the projects there. This is, a, I assure you, 10 years from now, the world will be a totally, totally different place. And the majority of the world's people will be well fed and happy. then the impetus is moving us towards war. And it's not inevitable, but we've got to do some things to, to change that. And first and foremost is to communicate, number one, that the reality is that war is on the agenda of the British Empire. And the second point, though, is to show that we actually are on the verge of moving into a post-Obama era. Now, this was clear from what happened on November 4th. The American people repudiated Obama and everything that he's done as president. This was not a pro-Republican vote. and In fact, it was one of the lowest numbers of uh, total voters in any recent midterm election. Uh, it was, in some states, it was 33 to 36 percent. And what does that tell you? Well, we're in the midst of an incredible crisis a war danger, but also an ongoing, unfolding financial crisis. And yet people are so demoralized and have such a small level of thinking about themselves and their responsibility, they didn't even vote, much less become active and involved in the campaign. Now, we did something important with our campaign in Texas, and that was that with Keisha Rogers, we made a decision. It was Lyndon LaRouche, Keisha, myself, and a couple of others, that we would use her campaign for U.S. Senate to change the agenda of the elections, to change the agenda from the social issues, uh, the big government, little government, tax, no tax, to actually take up the fundamental question of the impeachment of Obama and the move toward the Eurasian land bridge perspective, which we're now saying is, the U.S. must join the BRICS. We didn't quite have that formulation then, but we said we would change the discussion. And I think you can see that we were successful in doing that in the election. The issue of the 2014 midterm elections was Obama. And those who voted repudiated him. Those who didn't vote were repudiating him as well. And a small group of people voted for the Democrats just because they were so scared of what the Republicans would do. Now, this gets to the bigger issue that I want to raise in, in the minutes ahead for the desire of people to clean up the mess we have in politics, which is at heart a mess in the self-conception of a citizen. And this comes back to the, the founding of our republic. And if you want to start with this idea of the metrics of progress, what is it? It's the idea of where does wealth come from? What is what is a value? And, you know, I do a lot of different work uh, in my role as a Western state spokesman, and some of it is radio shows. And there, I do radio shows with so-called progressives. They're all anti-Wall Street, but they're impotent. I do radio shows with libertarians and Ron Paul people, and they want to get rid of the Federal Reserve as long as they don't have to do anything to do it. And you have all these people who have these ideas that are against the direction of the country. But what do they do? What are they doing with it? And I would argue that the biggest problem we have is that most of the people we talk to every day place little value on their own minds and the development of their minds. And that's why they fall prey to this idea for, for me. And that is something that's a section in the Landbridge Report called the Metrics of Progress. How do we think about what we do in our life, in our lifetime? What is it that would cause us to act to affect a political, social, economic revolution in the Western Hemisphere, in the transatlantic region? What kind of quality of self-conception is required to do that? And this gets to the heart of what Lyndon LaRouche's lifelong mission is. And he was reiterating that 
in the discussions we had today. Look, our, our short-term mission is in the United States, we have to get rid of Obama. Uh, in Canada, you've got to get rid of the Queen, but that's, I'm not going to discuss that. That's your business. You have to take care of that. But what we have to do together is inaugurate an era of progress based on technologies that are either available to us or that are within sight of our imagination, provided we have the determination to do it. And Lynn said the first thing we have to address is getting people determined to do it. Making that, all right, well, it's nice to be with you. Uh, I'm here in uh, Leesburg today where I just had an opportunity to have a lunch session with Mr. LaRouche. And I want to communicate a couple of the ideas that were central in his thinking today and then just take up the kind of quality and thinking that we're going to have to generate in the population if we're going to achieve the progress that's implicit in the land bridge proposal. Now, Helga Zeplerouche a couple weeks ago had a very interesting way of putting the strategic situation. She said it's as though we're hanging on a thread between heaven and hell. And the hell is a danger of thermonuclear war. And it, as Lynn has been stressing, there's no guarantee we're going to have a nuclear war, but there's no guarantee that we're not. And as long as the gang that's in power in the United States right now, through Obama, and with an alliance with a neocon such as Victoria Newland and the State Department, John McCain and his crowd in the U.S. Senate, the, the crazy warmongering Republicans, and cowardly Democrats who are afraid to challenge Obama, uh, 